Welcome to another episode of Pop for Good, a podcast where we learn from those doing good in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and the world, why they care, what we can do, and most importantly, what you, what the listeners can do. Pod for Good is produced and edited by Random Productions, which is me. So if you like how we sound and are thinking about starting a podcast, reach out to me. I am easy to find. Pod for Good can be found anywhere you get your podcast. And if you enjoy what we do here, please make sure to subscribe and share this episode on social media. I, as always, am your chief philanthropod and class clown for microclimates, Jesse Ulrich. And I am your vice admiral philanthropod and class clown for outdoor enrichment, Chris Miller. And today we are talking with Marguerite Arthrell Kanisik, the founder and executive director of Under the Canopy. We talked to Marguerite about the wonders of nature education, what it really takes to create a charter school, and something good that Broken Arrow did for once. Yeah, to find out what that is, you have to listen. So, enjoy. We are very excited to have Marguerite on the podcast today. Marguerite, how are you doing today? I am doing great. Thanks for asking. Yeah, it is uh, it is warm. It is July in Oklahoma. And I feel like we were being teased for like nine days. Like, oh, maybe it'd be cool this month now. So, <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> so if you're listening to this in September, know that it was hot in July. Uh, if for some reason, you would forget that fact. So that was a fun little weather tangent I just did. So Marguerite, you are you are the founder of Under the Canopy, correct? That's right. Founder and executive director, I'm assuming. Mm-hmm. So, for Pop for Good listeners, they will they will know that we have had similar organizations on the podcast recently. Um, Global Gardens being one of them, but we've had other ones that are very taking an educational aspect and making it sort of I don't know how to describe it, like a a, a, a more focused examination of part of the world and nature that students interact with. So for our listeners, why don't you give us like a brief summary of what the mission of Under the Canopy is? For sure. So Under the Canopy is a nature explorers program and our focus is on outdoor enrichment and nature connection with young people across Tulsa public school campuses. We also do a homeschool program and summer camps and those are open to all students, not just Tulsa students. And I do some adult workshops as well. So, as our listeners will know, I'm not one who loves nature necessarily. So, <laughs> I have nothing against nature. I'm happy nature's around. I want to maintain nature. I just don't necessarily want to spend... Be in, I don't want to spend a lot of time in it necessarily. There are bugs and heat and whatnot. What made you, as someone who obviously probably cares about education, want to focus on sort of the natural world? Good question. So, I... Well, as a young person, I really love being outside, but I also grew up in a city. I didn't grow up in the countryside. And being in my backyard was my big moment of nature connection. It was just a small backyard in the Northeast. And right there is where I spent a lot of my days just examining nature up close, being quiet, telling myself stories, playing, having my friends over. That was like, that was like mostly where my nature connection happened. I I sometimes got to go out and do some camping and go on hikes and stuff like that. But we mostly lived in a little city. And as I was growing up, I I was more focused on the arts. And that's actually my background's multimedia art. So I infuse art and in everything that we do at Under the Canopy. But um, I just realized that the place where I thought I could do the most good was around helping people to discover their own personal connection with nature. And I've worked with young people for ever <laughs> since I was a teenager. And it just was a natural uh, progression to uh, make an actual program for young people. Uh, when I left school, I was in a social justice and art focused program, but they led us to a lot of the designing of the curriculum. And I always put an outdoor focus in what I was mm -hmm. doing. And I realized that that's when I had the most fun was taking people outside. And then when I moved to Tulsa, that was in Austin, Texas, and it was with the creative action. And then when I moved here to Tulsa, I started work at the Tulsa Botanic Garden and was the program's assistant out there. And that's when I really started developing a relationship with the nature here in Tulsa and Oklahoma and the green country. And I had the chance to just 
really get people outside and really get them Mm -hmm. noticing. And I had so much fun with that and I really wanted to expand it. And that's how Under the Canopy began from my experience working there and then moving into starting my own program. Well, as someone who actually does enjoy nature, I'm curious, uh, what do the programs actually look like? Well, that's a great question. So most of the programs happen on Tulsa public school campuses. They're an hour and a half long. We accept children really pre-K through fifth, but our our focus is on K through third graders. Mm -hmm. I think that's the, the focus group of where our curriculum hits. Anyway, they, they join us after school and unless it's dangerous, we meet outside. So we're outside in cold weather, we're outside in wet weather and we have to be prepared for that. And we have an actual gear closet as a part of our program to make sure that the children have what they need to keep warm or to keep cool in some mm-hmm. cases. <laughs> and we go outside and we start with a circle time where they're having an opportunity to share how their day's been going, how they're feeling, and also just get a sense of like what we're going to do that day. Then they have free play. I think free play is so important to nature connection, especially at the end of a long school day. Young people's heads are filled with so much information and they really need a time to just be and have fun together. So we do free play time. And then we gather together and have a lesson based around their interests, really. We start off with like an interest survey at the beginning of the year, Mm -hmm. but we're we're developing curriculum as we go along that is focused on animals and plants and anything that connects them to Oklahoma. We don't really talk too much about things outside of where we are right now. And then the lessons sometimes have art elements, sometimes they're gardening elements, And some of them are just solely focused on animals. We did a whole unit on ancient Oklahoma. So we're really focused on the really amazing animals that lived in Oklahoma and plants. And then we play a game and then we close. It's a really beautiful little rhythm for them. It really holds that space. And we do it throughout the entire school year. So we start right after Labor Day and then go through May. How many many schools are you at right now? So last year, we were able to serve four schools, and we're hoping to expand that right now. We're sort of in the middle of a few grants to Mm -hmm. expand our programming even more. Are there any specific criteria for which schools or how, how, I guess, how how does a school connect specifically with Under the Canopy? Yeah, for sure. So mostly people reach out to me, and that's been the main way that I've been able to start developing programs on various school campuses. We started at Mayo, though, um, and that's actually where my children went, So, or my oldest went. Mm -hmm. And partly I chose that school because I, you know, had the most community buy-in, right, and connection to it, but also because they have a community garden and wild nature space on the campus. So that is something that is particular about our program. You need to have some access to a park or to an area that's green with some trees. It doesn't have to be like rugged, wild nature, you know, (laughs) but there needs to be like something so that we can actually delve in Mm -hmm. more than just a grassy lawn with no trees. I think it'd be really actually hard to find a sort of truly pure wild natural place these days i mean even even when you go camping those are camping grounds designed for people to come and camp and like they have obviously less things than a city would but they're still people are maintaining walking paths and whatnot i mean i grew up in a cul-de-sac with a park behind me and that park was really like underdeveloped for most of my childhood and that was also the park i would bike home through as broken arrow grew and kept building newer schools closer to my house and i loved that park like it was it was so quiet and there were just these massive trees and animals and whatnot. And I'm amazed, one, that I never broke a bone in that park or two, never like got a weird, never got like like ticks or anything there. Because I know they exist. I know other people got them. Um, <laughs> but yeah. I just I, didn't like you. Yeah, well, that's fine. I didn't like them either. <laughs> but no, there's definitely, I mean, especially if you go to elementary school in a city that's growing or is stressed by the amount of students in it, you're usually in a very like cramped indoor space that's probably straining under the um, amount of people in it and so going outside would be more relaxing i know i i always enjoyed 
going outside during school days, you know, mm-hmm. especially after school. Like that's all you want to do is get out of that building. So yeah, I find, I find that a very positive thing to do. Cause then you could, if you can also teach the students something during that time, I think it's a, that's a, that's a benefit. Mm-hmm. I mean, cause you would like to know what these things are. I always, I'm a very inquisitive person. I'm always like, what is this plant? What is this tree? What is that creature coming towards me? Well, Jesse, you need to come hang out with me yeah, because I can it. help you with all of that. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what I'm here for. It's sort of like side-by-side mentoring is yeah. how we see it. It's like how to like explain about nature, but not in a way that's just super technical. Like mm-hmm. it's like answer their questions when they have them or even better, let them experience that thing without having to name it. Yeah. Our culture is really obsessed with naming things. <laughs> we that's love true. naming things. Yeah, and I true. understand that because it's like, oh, now I suddenly have that knowledge, right? Mm-hmm. And it's kind of exciting. Yeah. But like to really experience a flower just by like touching it and smelling it mm-hmm. and like trying to draw it. We, we do a lot of drawing because mm-hmm. one of the main takeaways from our program are nature journals. So the children are assembling and working on their nature journals throughout the entire yeah. semester. And then they get it at the end of the semester. So they don't take home any work until the end. And it's a really wonderful way. As a parent, I know, like, my kid shows me something and it's like, oh, that is that going to happen in the recycling bin? Or, like, how am I going <laughs> to find it through their, yep. you know, like, right. shoved in the back of their backpack? But when it comes to me in a nature journal, it's like, oh, this is, like, what mm-hmm. they have done. And I can watch the progression of their drawing. And Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I can't help but think that, you know, one aspect of this is them actually experiencing and seeing how nature is changing and how it impacts the environment they live in. Is that something that you explore? Are you talking them? about like the changing of the seasons or other well, things? Well, I mean, just like uh, in general, how humans can impact nature, how climate change is occurring or, yeah, just, just how the world around them changes, both how they impact it and how the broader world can impact them. Oh, definitely. Definitely. I mean, one of the major things we do is a service project every year around Earth Day where we're talking about what we can do for our community Mm -hmm. and how we can help make our community more beautiful and more vibrant. And that includes, usually kids immediately go to trash pickup, (laughs) which is actually quite an issue. It's kind of shocking how much trash is around town and figuring out safe ways for kids to take care of that is yeah. is a whole nother thing but we we do do a trash pickup every right around earth day yeah. as a part of that but yeah we are addressing sustainability mm-hmm. and i really think that sustainability includes an understanding of how to love our planet and how to care for it yeah so yeah. that is part of the foundation of our school you know as a as a, like a Lord of the Rings type nerd, like one of the things you accidentally learn about is the fact that like things under the ground are cooler than the things above the ground, right? Like the <laughs> hobbit holes are d- were designed specifically for a reason, which is like the ground is much better at keeping you temperate than any sort of artificial structure, right? And that's always mm-hmm. sort of stuck with me. And, uh, and, you know, as someone who now owns a house and has had to now repair that house after our storm, I'm like, none of this makes any sense. Why do we build things this way? <laughs> We should all be building in the earth, right? Yeah, I mean, like, and I know, like, uh, I know there's a company that will come and, like, build you a, like, backyard freezer thing where, like, it, you know, it's like a pretty much a, like, big hole in that goes down a couple feet to keep things cool. And I'm just like, that's a great idea. Like, obviously, they're, it's probably not that great, but for the environment of your area. But that idea, like, we're not using the natural resources around us to their, to their most at the moment. That's because we've never been trained on how to do that. So that's just something I've been thinking about okay. recently. So, no, definitely. Mm-hmm. And I mean, what you're addressing also is something called microclimates. So it's like, how do we actually notice, like, how we can protect, and what am I trying to say? How we can make a area that is working for you environmentally, for like your home, or like you know, like I, I think about this storm recently, mm-hmm. right? So. We have these giant oak trees in our property, and thankfully, they did not get torn down, but so many did in our neighborhood, and it's really changed the landscape of our neighborhood. And I I just was talking to a neighbor, and I'm like, your bills are going to go way up now. And he's like, I know, I know. And it's crazy, like, because mm-hmm. it's like those oak trees protect our homes. Yeah, They're not just, like, 
beautiful and yeah. helping clean our air. I mean, like it's actually a huge loss to lose all yeah. these massive trees. Yeah, it is. And, you know, even in, cause uh, we have really huge trees in our backyard as well. And we didn't lose any of the actual trees, but a whole bunch of very big branches up high came mm-hmm. down, right? So it's thinned out the foliage quite a bit. And so now there's an area of our back backyard that was always just basically dead space that now has a bunch of like weeds and stuff growing. And so it's just interesting to see how the environment changes when something like that happens, you know, and how, because these are hundred plus year old trees, yeah. right? And just seeing the impact of those being thin, because our neighborhood has a lot of trees as well. And some of the, our streets were just devastated by how many, you know, we luckily didn't have any damage to our house or anything. Sorry, Jesse. That's fine. But the loss of trees is huge. I mean, our neighbor had a massive tree in their front yard that provided shade to our house. Now the front of our house is hotter than it was before. Yeah. Well, and it's one of the things you think about where in the past people built, built homes at an angle so that the breeze would come in through their windows in a certain direction to keep the house cool. And then with with air conditioning, homes didn't have to be built that way. But then like when you don't have power for a week, you're like, man, I really wish the breeze would like come through this house. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, that's, I, the, that's not nature related, but you know. Well, oh, no, it totally is. And I would say just I mean, getting back to you being a Lord of the Rings fan. Um, one of the ways that we really work with people on Nature Connection is by using stories to talk about nature. And we specifically do this a lot in our summer camps. And we actually had a full Lord of the Rings summer camp. Hell yeah. And we we often use literature Mm -hmm. um, to get kids excited about nature. If you're like me, you might hear estate planning and go, ugh, gross. You might think to yourself, I'm not sure why I'd bother with that. Estate planning is only for the uber rich. Tall grass begs to differ. Tallgrass founding attorneys Laurel and Riley think everyone should have an estate plan. They know estate planning seems untouchable to a lot of folks, like something you have to do inside a stuffy law firm of stuffy McLawyer Pants Esquire. But I promise you, Tallgrass is nothing like that. For one, they work out of their home so their clients can feel at home. They obsess, because they're nerds, over making clients feel like they belong and are supposed to be there. Also, their kids might make an appearance. They will take time to answer all of your questions, even the uncomfortable ones. They will work relentlessly to make sure your plan is exactly what you need to feel secure and at peace. So if you've been putting off planning for what's going to happen after you've gone, it's time for you to give Tallgrass a call at 918-770-8940 and start your plan today. Or visit their website at tallgrassestateplanning.com and schedule a free initial consultation. For free! It's right there on the website. And of course, there's more because this is a podcast ad. If you tell them you're a Pod for Good listener, they're going to take 25% off their service fees. Just tell them Pod for Good sent you. Stop thinking estate planning isn't for you and give Tallgrass a call today at 918-770-8940 or on their website, which I'm not going to read out to you again. It's in our show notes. Thank you, Tallgrass. Well, and speaking of nature, nature can also sometimes not be particularly friendly to humans, but still it's important, you know, whether it's, you know, things that can be afraid of like spiders or bees or stuff that can be dangerous like storms. How do you approach it when kids may be afraid of certain aspects of of nature? Yeah. So, I mean, we have to address this all the time, right? And I mean, I have to deal with my own feelings about (laughs) Specifically, chiggers was the issue at our last summer oh. camp. Unfortunately, just we didn't have ticks, but we had chiggers. Is and there we had any to deal with them. positive impact to the environment that chiggers provide? Yeah, because it feels is there like anything, they're just all bad, right? Like, like they're I, just <laughs> demons. No, because I, I feel like we've I feel like we've turned around on bees. We're we're all pro bees yeah, now, yeah, right? Bee. Yeah. Um, I feel like I'm I'm definitely pro spider. Spiders do a lot. I mean, they eat a lot of mosquitoes. So. Yes, that's true. Yeah, spiders are pretty incredible. Yeah. yeah, and there's really only two poisonous ones here, or venomous ones that you mm-hmm. need to worry about. Yeah, but yes, yeah, so chiggers have no positive. They don't do anything good for nature. As far as I know, ticks and chiggers and mosquitoes are just terrible. 
<laughs> yeah, mosquitoes real like mosquitoes. There's a reason parasite doesn't have a good connotation. Yeah, I guess that's true. That's true. <laughs> Chickers are an arachnid family. So oh. they actually are related to spiders. But they're microscopic, so you can't tell. Mm. So Ugh, sorry, you were terrible. talking about your you, okay, you were talking sorry. about <laughs> before we went off on a chicken stand. You were talking about the your summer summer camp. Yeah. You to, well, I was just gonna say, like, I meet young people and adults, everybody, mm -hmm. where yeah. they're at, right? And I'm not gonna push anybody to do things that they're uncomfortable with. At the same time, though, we do try to give measured steps towards getting comfortable. So I, I have this nature program and I have two children and my oldest is terrified of insects. I mean, still, and I mean, years and years. I mean, this is a nature baby. She has been going camping. She has been all out in the woods. I mean, mm -hmm. backwoods camping even, and still just so scared of insects. And I have to work with her all the time on it. And it's like a matter of having attention and grace for people, you know, right. just giving them that space to be like, you're scared of this. Let's talk about what this thing is and let's learn about it. And yeah, I don't expect people to immediately be really excited about wasps or something, but wasps are a really great lesson. And here's an insect that you shouldn't touch or go near, but is also a pollinator and is also has this has this way in our environment of helping to shape what we eat and it, like respecting those things and learning about them but also giving them space and time to to not be too scared yeah i mean wasps wasps are really an interesting case because unlike bees like bees will only sting you if you get up in their business wasps though are like you're in my business right <laughs> it does feel w wasps like that. are wasps are i mean I'm, correct me if i'm wrong but like wasps are always sort of agitated, right? Yeah. Like they, they are born <laughs> agitated, they die agitated. Mm -hmm. And every time I see a wasp, I'm like, just listen, I'll leave you your space if you leave me my space. And, <laughs> and, and they always start coming for me. I'm like, all right, fine. Like I didn't want to, I didn't want it to go this way, but this is the way it's going. <laughs> anyway, I just feel I, 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 I'm, I'm, listen, I'm, I'm, you're anti wasp. I'm not anti wasp. I'm, I am anti mosquito, but I'm in agreement with you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> mosquitoes, as far as I know, do not do anything positive for the environment. So we actually want the things that eat mosquitoes more. We mm -hmm. want them. So like I've also like turned around on spiders. I'm like, yeah, get those mosquitoes. Yeah. But well, it's interesting. And like we were thinking that maybe so we we run our summer camps, we 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 rent a space for it. Um, and it's a nature preserve, but they they actually there's a playground that's all shaded. It's awesome. And we think that the kids were mostly getting the chiggers on that playground. And we were like, oh, they spray the playground. And it was almost like the insects that uh, might have killed the chiggers, that might have mm. eaten them, might have died. So then the chiggers had the opportunity to populate really intensely. Yeah. And I do want to say that no one has ever gotten a wasp sting in the seven years that I've been well, teaching under that's the good. canopy. I'm going to knock on wood yeah, as I say this. Yeah. But like, I, yeah. I've yes. been stung by a wasp. It's not great. It is um, terrible. Right. But, yeah. It, it, at a summer camp, actually. So, <laughs> um, um, but no, that, I mean, that is a good example of what humans do. We try to control our environment and nature finds ways to push back. You know, you mm -hmm. can't really fully control it so that you end up creating unintended consequences. Should I, should I drop in the uh, Jeff Goldblum uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, nature? Uh, yeah. Life finds a way. Yeah. In, in that part. Yeah. I guess it, one good thing the mosquitoes have done in the fictional world is, you know, allow Jurassic Park to exist, which I guess might be actually a bad thing considering what happens in every Jurassic Park movie. But <laughs> so, I mean, one of the biggest things anytime we talk about something related to education, I always feel like we, we as Americans view education improperly anyway, but it always feels like it is a everyone fighting over a small amount of pie. And so I'm always like, OK, like, what is the argument for? What is the positive you can tell a parent? Be like, you should let your kid play in nature and learn things from me because it helps them with this and that and the other thing. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> now I have to spend some statistics on. <laughs> yes. Yeah, because I mean, so, some people like numbers. I'm like, I am all for teaching students things that don't necessarily have a quantifiable point to them. Like mm -hmm. teaching a student how to appreciate art doesn't have a, 
thing that you can quantify later on. I just believe culture is important. I, I think some people would argue that it does, but that's that's different. well, yeah. I'm listen, I'm fine to have that <laughs> argument, but you know, some people are like arts education is important. We should be teaching them how to qualify for college and how to get jobs, right? Only those skills. And I'm like, no, we should teach them how to be a well-rounded individual. So I'm on I'm on both of your sides here. <laughs> but for the people who do need um some statistics, like what what would those be? I am a part of an organization called the Natural Start Alliance. And they the, are the NSA? wonderful. <laughs> okay. uh, mm, suspicious. No. Interesting answer, yeah, no, sorry. Sorry. Not related to that. Yeah, all right, all right. <laughs> so you would like us to believe. No, all right, sorry, go ahead. So the Natural Start Alliance is a wonderful organization for giving you all of those wonderful statistics of just like, these are the things that make it, why it is so important for young people to be outside and connecting with nature. I am not the person that can give you like 60% of students evaluated, said this or that. But I will say that it has been statistically proven that young people actually do better cognitively if they've spent time outside. Like there are actual studies that state Mm -hmm. like the more time children have spent outdoors, when they come inside to learn, they can learn better. They can, they have higher functioning. They're able to sit still longer. They're able to listen and take more in. The act of being outside actually changes our brains to make us be able to pay better attention. That's fascinating. It's fascinating to me mostly because you think about like, you know, the stereotypical college experience. A lot of those images are like students outside studying, right? That's and that's mm-hmm. not something you get the freedom to do in like middle school and high school. Yeah. Yeah. And I, 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 we never had a study hall where we could go sit on the, sit on the lawn yeah, and read a book. Yeah. I mean, oh, that's too bad. I know <laughs> our, our, our high school, by the time we got to it, wouldn't even let us like, leave campus for lunch. So yeah. there um, had been issues with prior class, prior years. So like, Nope, you don't get to leave the, yeah. the building. Until, yep. Until, Which reminds even me. Even senior year. Even senior yeah. year. Oh, wow. We were real upset about it. But that reminds me, because Chris and I both went Broken Arrow, and when you and I met uh, a couple weeks ago, you were telling me about something new in Broken Arrow that I found fascinating. And I want I want to finally give Broken Arrow some props on this podcast. So <laughs> can you tell us about what is right next to the high school these days? Oh, I definitely can. It's called the Vanguard Academy, and it opened in 2021. It is a project-based learning and... I think they have one other focus. I, the, their agriculture program is also oh, within cool. the space. They've built this amazing facility where they are, they take like a cohort of 75 children from Broken Arrow schools. I think you apply to get in and they will be with them from freshman year through senior year. And that cohort not only is able to access the really awesome experience of project-based learning, which includes lots of STEAM education and all sorts of things, but they also get to take their uh, electives on the school campus at the main campus so they can still do choir and cheer and football and whatever they want to do and like be in the orchestra or band. I think it's a really wonderful way that Broken Arrow has figured out how to have an alternative model but still be able to utilize, which is what I'm all about, utilizing the resources around you and and making those community connections. So it's not just all these individualized schools having to reinvent the wheel. Um, Um, That sounds super cool. I think Mm -hmm. I really would have enjoyed that. Um, You definitely should um, go on a tour or something. That's how I was able to find out about it. I mean, one really neat thing is they have this... uh, like they have a big outdoor area. And one of the things they're teaching is what's called ancestral skills. That's something we also teach at Under the Canopy, which is really just learning about the skills of sustainability. So like how to build shelters, how to gather water if you're like in a survival situation, you know, that sort of thing. And in that area, they had all of this because it was an old farm. There was like a dumping ground at some point that like the farmer had let people just dump a bunch of stuff. And they brought the project to the kids and they said that the question was, what do we do with all of this old landfill stuff? Because a lot of it was just like old rusted machinery and that sort of thing. And the first thought, the kids were like, clean it up, you know, bring it to the other dump. And they're like, so it'll just sit in (laughs) another dump, right? And the young people were like, yeah, that doesn't actually make sense. What could we actually do with this? And then one of them's like, let's transform it. Let's make art. 
And I love that. So, I mean, they're high school students, so they can safely work with like rusted metal as mm-hmm. long as they're being like managed yeah. and, you know, yeah. like have the proper equipment, like strong gloves and whatnot. But they are doing that right now. They're slowly taking apart the old landfill. It's, it's really old, so they don't have to worry too much, you know? Yeah. And they're making art with it. Really on the cool. school campus. That is really cool. Yeah. I mean, I just, I, I do think that, and I think we talked about this, and that this is my joke about every, everything, which is like, there are certain grades that students don't learn anything during, like seventh grade, for example. Like, the kids shouldn't be in school. They should be out doing this. They should be out <laughs> learning a skill, like, you know, how to cut wood, for example. That's a skill I wish I had before three weeks ago. Um, <laughs> how to cut wood properly. Yes. That's a skill I a skill I have now. But yeah, like, so almost the what to do in emergencies or just how to survive without things that you are used to is, I think, a skill set students would enjoy having earlier in life than they normally have to get them. So mm. I love turning old trash into art. That's always fun. Yeah. So because, yeah, I, I bet there's some real f- funky, cool stuff. In that in that landfill, so oh yeah, it really but, is. Also, classic broken arrow that some farmers just like yeah, dump things here. That's uh, <laughs> that feels very. But I feel like that's that should be broken arrow's tagline. Yeah, you d- dump yeah, your trash here. Dump your yeah. trash. Here. Sorry, broken arrow. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, you couldn't. You couldn't stay nice. I couldn't. I couldn't. I couldn't. <laughs> Listen, they know what they did. I mean, you might be heading in this direction, but I haven't talked to you about what the latest project is. No, we haven't. So, I mean, part of the reason why I was visiting the Vanguard Academy and other schools is because we are actually looking at opening up our own public charter eco-education school. Yes. I'm so excited you brought it up and I didn't bring it up because (laughs) I know know starting a school is a lot of work. And and I know, and Chris and I are not very knowledgeable in sort of the charter school system here in Oklahoma. So... We we have questions, and we would like to first focus yeah. on what you're doing before yes. we derail ourselves yes. in general charter school questions. Yeah, well, I mean, mostly, I guess the first, this question will, I think, address both of those things, which is how do, like, if you care about a, one particular part of education, but you want to start a charter school, what are the requirements that a charter school sort of in general has to do, right? Yeah, so charter schools are public schools. They are subject to the same kind of uh, um, assessments and the same kind of um, rigor and authorizing that a regular public school has. They just have the opportunity also to bring some new and innovative kinds of education and maybe also some specific, we say like some specific kinds of like catering to a specific kind of audience. And I guess so. The question is like, why, why aren't all public schools in this case charter schools? Does that, does that question make sense? Yeah, like, I, it, I see it, what you're saying. I think that it's just about the history of how schools have been formed, and a lot of them have been formed around neighborhoods. And so the standardized way we have done education in the United States has continued on because people are just like that. This is. They're not looking at like the individual students as much and they're looking more at like, okay, well, this is like what public education looks like. And one of the ways that that's been addressed in the 60s and 70s was through magnet schools. We're lucky in Tulsa that there are quite a few magnet schools and that the magnet schools were invented as a way to desegregate schools. And then they also have focuses. So we now have like a Montessori magnet in Tulsa and we have Um, Mayo, which is its own kind of community education experience. And yeah, but then charter schools get another level of autonomy. So autonomy for accountability is how we talk about it. Because you're definitely getting the accountability of being in a public school system. There's so much, (laughs) so much accountability. (laughs) And then, but then it's also giving you that chance to really bring something new to students that isn't happening otherwise. So what is your vision for this school? So I really love what I do. Under the canopy is just my dream, right? And I'm, it's not cutting it 1.5 hours a week with one week, well, once a week with these individual students. We're just like, we want to expand this program. And I... I can easily see how we can meet all of these wonderful 
what do I want to say? Like how we can have our education be fulfilled while like, so all the math and the reading and the writing and the history all within the context of what we're already doing. And I was like, why not try for a day long program and really explore that? And I am right now in an administrative training and it's blowing my mind. It's so interesting. There are so many facets to running a school and being really ready for all of the, all the things that come your way. And I feel like under the Canopy After School program has been such a wonderful way to get us ready for all of that because we have to do all of it in the after school program on a micro level. It'll just be expanding it and having yeah. lots of help. <laughs> yeah. Have you thought of a name for your school yet? Well, so far we're, we're starting with the idea of it being called Under the Canopy School, but that might change. We'll see. <laughs> I feel like naming of a charter school is like a big deal because like you can... You don't have to name it after a neighborhood. You don't have to name it after a person and then have to change it to, to when you find more find more out about that person 100 years later. Um, <laughs> yeah. But no, I, th- I think that... So it's really like you have to teach students everything they'd learn at a regular public school, but like they can have math class outside and there could be programs both before and after school that are sort of nature-based versus the other things that... Even a special during the day. I mm-hmm. mean... In- a nature educator is going to be on our staff. I think it's, I think it's, I think it's really cool. I mean, yeah. again, supporters of public education are not people who say like our public education system is perfect. What we're saying is like fund it more and yeah. like and allow for you know ways to make it better for the students, not just better mm-hmm. for the budget of said city and or in Oklahoma's case, the state funding of cities public education system, which I yeah. know is your your favorite soapbox. Mm. Um, Well, and I think that as people have studied more about education itself and its impact, you've learned that one size does not fit all, right? You, the problem that, that you find with a lot of kids who underperform in schools, it's not because they're less intelligent or they're lazy. It's because the style of education that we're trying for them is ineffective Mm -hmm. and having only or largely only one option for most kids, right? Those kids are not going to be able to go to a private school, you know, in, in TP in, in Tulsa Public Schools area, most of the students are not going to be able to afford to go to a truly private school. So their option is TPS. And if they're not providing alternate forms of education, some kids are going to fall through the cracks. So having realistic other options, I think, is important. And finding ways to, you know, integrate those into TPS and into charter schools or programs or something can be huge for lifting up all the kids. Yeah, I totally agree. For our listeners, like if they are interested in this, if they are either parents or people without kids, uh, like what is the best way they can help and support you? Oh yeah, thank you for asking that. So we really need uh, school champions right now. People that are excited about this idea that want to meet with me, I am all ready to meet with you and have conversations about this. We are having community events monthly. Uh, we just were at the Tulsa Drillers game the other night and had a booth there and we did a community talk at the library last month. So there's going to be lots of opportunities for connecting with the school and learning more about it. You don't have to be a parent to be interested in seeing this school happen. And one of the main ways you can actually help with all of this is by signing a petition. So the petition doesn't say, I'm enrolling in this school. It's just saying, I want this school to exist. I think it should be an option for young people in Tulsa. And um, you can access that by looking at our website, which is underthecanopy.org. And if you look on the main page, you'll get a link. Take the survey. It's right there. And at the end of that is the petition. Yes. What are other ways that people can connect? Do you have... Facebook, Instagram, any, oh, yeah, anything definitely. else? Okay. Under are, you, are you on nature? threads? Are you on, are, are, are you on threads? <laughs> <laughs> That's been, TikTok. Do you do any yeah. TikToks? Nature talks. Oh, yeah, nature talks. Like, uh, <laughs> I probably should get up with the times. I have not done TikTok yet. No, but is, I do do Instagram. I do the the older TikTok. The there you adult, go. The adult yeah. TikTok. The adult TikTok. <laughs> yeah, <that's, laughs> the non-moving TikTok. Um, <laughs> no, no. The, oh, we do the reels. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we do the reels. 
So, um, yes, we're on Instagram, we're on Facebook, we're on Pinterest. Definitely, you can follow us in all those places. Chris and I never remember to bring up Pinterest as a... (laughs) <laughs> that's true. As a social that's media, that's, that says something about Chris and I. But um, Oh, it's really great for educators. And I right. think I that's imagine. where people like it. You get to look at the boards and be like, oh, that's how they thought of that. Or mm-hmm. I thought of something else. Uh, yes. Another way that we would love for people to get involved is we're actually in the process of looking for the land where our school will live. Mm. We have several opportunities right now, but we're always looking for more. So if anyone has an idea of like, mm-hmm. oh, that would be the perfect spot for an eco-education school. I send them my way, please. Listeners, get on it. If you yeah. own land or know of land that is available, like reach out to Marguerite. Well, and beyond the school, uh, what if they want to get involved with Under the Canopy? Do you have volunteers? Do you take money? I mean, <laughs> how can people support the broader organization? Definitely. So again, if you go to our website, you can see a place where you can donate. We are always loving any donations that come in. We specifically have a scholarship fund and that really makes our program accessible to all the children that want to do it. And we also definitely have volunteers and we'll definitely need, be needing more in this next year in terms of like helping with these community events that we're all doing and, and getting ready for the school to open. Our, our goal is for the school to open in fall of 2024. That's very cool. Well, Marguerite, thank you so much for joining us today. This is very exciting. And hopefully maybe after the massive hurdle of getting the land and then the school built and whatnot, maybe we'll have you back on to hear more about the school itself and how and how that, that all works. So oh, that would be great. Yeah. yeah. So it's an exciting year ahead. Yeah. Yeah. That well, Chris and I wish you both like lots of luck. And hopefully some people are like, hey, let's like, oh my God, I do know some place, a land, you know, I have <laughs> This location would be great for an eco, eco-friendly eco school. So, And I'm also very interested in how you're going to power said school. I, I, that'll be a separate conversation. <laughs> but I'm I'm very now into um, uh, heat pumps and other better for nature ways of cooling and heating things. So anyway, yeah. uh, we can talk about that later. I no one wants to hear me talk about heat pumps anymore. So I will, I will keep that in sort. But um, Marguerite, thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, thank you. Thank you all for listening to our episode with Marguerite. What a fantastic program. If you have kids and are just interested in nature education, like connect with her, help her. It, it's incredible. Kids should spend more time outside. So, kids should touch a, grass. Kids should touch grass, especially sweet Kentucky bluegrass. This podcast is brought to you by Kentucky bluegrass. Anyway, of course, under the canopy, will happily take your money, but they, they would certainly like your time and attention. But enough about them. Remember, Chris and I can truly only do pot for good because. People seem to care about the people we are interviewing and hearing our very tired shtick at this point. But please make sure to like and subscribe and give us a review on Apple Podcasts and try to keep it to above at least four stars if you can. (laughs) As always, Tulsa get it done. Broken Arrow, get a pass this week. Be Be kind to one another and stay cool out there.